Uh, Folks, we're reading tonight in John's Gospel, and we're in chapter 8. John's Gospel, chapter 8. We're going to read the first 11 verses of that chapter together. John's Gospel, chapter 8, then, and we're beginning in verse 1. As you know, we've been working our way through John's Gospel in Bible studies. Is it 14 or 15 or something like that we've done this season now? We haven't got to chapter 8 yet, so there we are. But we're going to read the first 11 verses. John chapter 8, verse 1. Jesus went on to the Mount of Olives. And early in the morning, he came again into the temple, and all the people came on to him. And he sat down and he taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down, and with his finger he wrote on the ground, as though he heard them not. (coughs) And so when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself, and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down, and he wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself, and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, Where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. And we just pray that the reading of the Lord's own word tonight will be a blessing in our midst for his name's sake and for his glory. The chapter commences... Jesus has spent some time, probably the night, in the Mount of Olives. And early in the morning, he has came down into the valley. He has recrossed the Kidron. He has entered into the temple. And the opening verses tell us that people gather around him, and he begins to teach them. The narrative continues. He hasn't gone too far in his teaching when a band of scribes and Pharisees, adorned with their, their customary badges of sanctity, approached him with this woman who was guilty of flagrant sin. There's no doubt about her guilt. She comes with them, they bring her to have an audience with the Lord Jesus Christ. They brought this trembling, no doubt, shrinking woman into the public eye. And folks, I want you to get that tonight because that's very important. They bring her into the public eye. Immorality at that time was ripe in the nation. You will find under Roman law, which was the rule of the day, this episode would have gone unnoticed because that's how the Romans were. They were a depraved race of people. But under the law of Moses, she was actually guilty. And she should be stoned to death according to the law in Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 10. But here's the thing. The law of Moses, as far as the nation was concerned, had long since fallen into disuse. And it was the Roman law, really, that was the rule of the day. And so they bring her to the Lord Jesus Christ. They bring her into this public place, they bring her to the Lord Jesus Christ and they try to trick him. Would he seek to revive the penalties of the ancient 
you know, Judaistic law, the Mosaic law? Or would he condemn himself by suggesting that the law of Moses wasn't really relevant? What would he do? And that was their purpose for bringing this dear soul into this situation. I want to spend the time tonight thinking about three ways that sin is dealt with. Three ways that we see. We've always seen it. We see it today. And no doubt we always will see it. And the first thing I want to say, here's, here's the first way sin is normally dealt with. It comes in the form of accusation. Accusation. Isn't it amazing how people who live in glass houses love to throw stones? I'm going to say that again. It's amazing how people who live in glass houses love to throw stones. You see, I'm quite sure if you take this situation, they bring this woman caught in the act, in the very act, mind you, of adultery. And they bring her into this public domain. She's in the temple area where there's a crowd of people who are gathering in the temple, where there's a crowd of people who have gathered around the Lord Jesus Christ to listen to him teach. And they have brought her out of some private place where this act had been carried out and they bring her into the public arena of where the people are. And that's what's happening here. Someone is caught doing something and immediately every single person has that person tried and condemned and the accusations fly. Verse 4 it says here, They say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. You know, folks, I look at stories like that. I look at this story in particular. And I wonder how many were in this band of sanctimonious scribes and Pharisees. I wonder how many who were in that band who actually caught her. The Bible doesn't tell us that. But I wonder how many of them actually caught her. Or I wonder how many of them were told along the way to the temple that she had been caught. And they decided to join in and follow along. All pulling, all shoving, and all accusing her. She's an adulteress. But wait a minute. Where's the adulterer? Why are they so keen to have this woman brought into this situation to present her before Jesus to try and trick him in this situation? Why are they so keen to have her accused whenever there's another party that's involved in this who doesn't appear in the scripture of this story whatsoever? And you have heard this preached on, no doubt before, by people who are much more eloquent than I am. And there's all sorts of suggestions that are made to us about these things. But where was the adulterer at? Why were they so anxious to get Jesus to condemn her while her companion in sin, or perhaps her seducer, had escaped? It's an incredible thing, isn't it? And so here she is. She has been caught probably in private. Whoever caught her has told others along the way. There's a band of them now who has brought her into this public area with Jesus. What do you want to do with her, Lord? But the story's only half full because the other party in the sin just simply isn't there. But there's accusation. Master, this woman was taken in adultery. In the very act. You know, folks, it's a terrible thing for a sinner to fall into the hands of other sinners. It really is. Because you usually find whenever a sinner falls into the hand of all our sinners, there's no mercy. No mercy. You see, at the moment, we're living at a time in our nation, 
Brexit, it's the big meal of the day, isn't that right? You get it for breakfast, you get it for lunch if you're there, you get it the evening tea, you'll get it again before you go to bed. And everybody has an opinion. Every, even I have an opinion, forgive me, but everybody has an opinion. And you see, everybody looks at the situation and everybody will accuse this one and will accuse that one and will accuse the other and why can't we do this and why can't we do it that way and why shouldn't we do it that way? And there's accusation that's flung. Do you know why? Because sinners are being accused by other sinners. And that's exactly what's happening here in this story before. See, let me say this to you tonight. Sin blinds people to their own faults. But sin sharpens people to accuse other people. Don't ever forget that. That's why Jesus talked about, you know, forgetting about the moat that's in your brother's eye and getting the plank of wood out of your own eye. Because sin blinds us to what we really are, but it sharpens us to see the faults and the shortcomings and the problems in other people. And that's exactly what has happened here in this story. You see, you take the world, you take the general public at large, and you know, if someone has done something that's wrong and they fall into the hands of an angry mob, the mob will kill them. That's what happens. That's what happens. And that's how sinners deal with sinners. No mercy. But let's forget about what we are ourselves and let's pass accusation upon the party that's involved in the crime or the sin that's being displayed before us. Can I say this to you lovingly? The church is no different. No different. The only difference with the church is we're saved, you see. We're saved. But still everyone has an opinion. Oh, but the church is not as bad as the world because the church has a slightly different take on it. Because the scriptures say in Matthew chapter 7, Judge not lest you be judged, for with what judgment you judge, it shall be measured unto you again. And so we don't pass judgment. We don't really judge. The church gossips instead. Let's gossip about that. Let's talk, let's share our views of that. Because everybody has an opinion. Do you know what such and such a person did? And folks, the church is really good at this. Even about matters that are not sinful. What do you think about that situation? What do you think about what she did? What do you think about what he did? What do you think about what he said? And we gossip about these things. So we do. You know, I was thinking about this. Gossip. Gossip. Giving over to speaking stupidly in public. Gossip. Giving over to speaking stupidly in public. None of us here would do that, would we? And yet, folks, every single one of us are guilty of it. And so in church life, whenever something cuts across us, or whenever something doesn't really go the way we would want it to go, oh yes, we have an opinion, and so we pass an accusation. And sometimes we gossip that situation to somebody else. That involves them in the gossip. Sometimes we gossip about people to somebody else. That involves the other person in the gossip that we gossip to the other person. And church life goes on and the wheels of church life grind and grind on and grind on. Our brother John shared with us this morning about dwelling together in unity, about the Lord commanding the blessing. And sometimes, if truth be told, there's very little unity in what we call the church, the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because we're given over to speaking stupidly in public about certain things that we know nothing about. And sometimes the session gets blamed. And sometimes the pastor gets blamed. And let me make you very clear. I know exactly what can be said at times about me. I'm only too aware of that. And this is not about me tonight. And I could go to the people who say the things. Because the danger about gossiping 
is you have to be very careful about who hears those things and who they take them back to. Gossip. Gossip. Oh, the session didn't do that right. The pastor didn't do that right. And you see, whenever we get involved in stuff like that, it gets bigger and it gets bigger and it gets bigger and it gets bigger. And that's how the church deals with this kind of thing. Accusation. Accusation. And quite often, if there's a situation that has arisen, the gossip adds fuel to the fire and makes it much more difficult for people who are trying to put the flames out. Because you see, everybody has to have an opinion. And let me say this to you also, your actions. Sometimes you don't have to speak a word. Sometimes your actions do the very same. Someone gets hurt, and your actions show clearly whose side you were on in that situation. And you completely disregard somebody else who's also a part of that situation. Disregard how they feel. What they're putting up with. Makes no odds as long as your opinion's put across. And folks, this is straight shooting here. This is straight shooting. Sometimes it's your lack of action that lets people know where you stand in a certain situation. Do you know the problem with accusation? It's always based upon what someone has told other people. It's never based upon pure fact. Always remember that and always be careful. And so coming back to our story, she stands in the hands of who knows how many accused in front of all publicly, a a, a spectacle Made to be a spectacle. And probably the worst of them, the most of them, weren't even there and didn't know the details of the situation that she was found in. Accusation, folks. It's a terrible thing to fall into the hands of other people who forget what they are themselves. And probably these men who brought this woman into the presence of Jesus. You know, their hearts may have been corrupt. Listen, they they maybe never were caught in an action such as this, but in their minds, in their hearts, who knows what had gone on there. But as I've said, sin, sin dulls what you see in yourself, but it sharpens what you see in other people so you can accuse them. And that's the first thing, accusation. But they bring her to the Lord Jesus Christ and they say to him, look, The law of Moses, verse 5, commands that she should be stoned. What do you say? The law commands that she should be stoned. What do you say? The law has got a threefold function, if you'll suffer me for just a moment or two. Because the law, first of all, shows us how we fall short of its demands. The law, it makes us feel, someone has said, the badness of our best. That's what the law does. It lets us see the badness of our best. The law also has to smite. The law also has to punish us whenever we step out of the path of goodness and right living that the law demands. That's what the law has to do. That's what it has to do. And so they bring her to Jesus. The law of Moses says that she should be stoned. She should be stoned. And so whenever they continue asking him, whenever they continue to press him, he said, he that's without sin among you, let him cast the first stone at her. Verse 7. And in saying that, they saw the ugly moat of uncleanness in the woman's eye, but not the beam of hypocrisy that was in their own eyes. Their own eyes. Their secret sins, perhaps, of unbelief. Their secret sins of deceit, perhaps. You see, they're as vile in Christ's sight as the sin that this woman has been caught committing. Those sins are just as important as well. And friends, let me make it clear tonight. Jesus came to deal with sin. Praise God, he forgives sins. 
But he came to deal with sin, bless his holy name. Not this sin, not that sin, not some sin. But sin as seen by the heart, or seen by the, the heart-searching eye of Almighty God. There are transgressors in thought as well as in deed. And Christ came, bless his holy name, not to set aside the law, but to fulfill the law. And he himself was without sin, and he was put to death by wicked men. Whenever someone falls into the hands of sinners. And so, he reveals, if you're without stone, without sin, you throw a stone. Can I ask in this congregation tonight, who would have thrown a stone at this woman? Let him that's without sin throw a stone. Folks, is there one of us here tonight who could have thrown a stone at this woman? And the answer is a million times no. Because we are all born in sin. We are all shapen in iniquity. We have all come short of his glory. We have all sinned. We have all sinned. And so the Bible says, Jesus spoke this to them, and they which heard being convicted, verse 9, by their own conscience, they went out one by one. Instead of judging the woman, they find that in his presence, they themselves are being judged. Their own sin is being highlighted. The Bible says he takes the wise in their own craftiness. That's what the Bible says. He takes the wise in their own craftiness. I have heard people preaching this. Jesus stoops down to the ground and he begins to write on the ground. And I've heard people saying, maybe he was writing sin. You know, liar. Thief. Maybe he was writing the sins that were in the hearts of these people. That could be. We're not told what he wrote. But one thing I do know, the Bible says he stooped down and he wrote in the ground. Perhaps he was showing what he would have to do for sin. The fact that there would come a time whenever he would be brought very, very low because of sin. In order to pay the price of sin. And you see, this evening, what was going to happen to this woman couldn't be conveyed by the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. Only what would happen to this woman could be revealed by the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because he came to die for sin. But the law, you see, the law demands. The law makes its demands. As I've said, the law must punish us. Whenever we step off the path of sin, dear one, let me say this to you in the service tonight. If you're unsaved tonight, and we have all sinned, but the commands of God are to produce in you an awareness of your own sin, an awareness of the fact that you have broken the laws of God, an awareness of the fact that even the best that's in you is still bad at its very best. And that law has to smite and punish because we have stepped out. We have stepped out. But the Bible also says the law is our school teacher, our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. And thank God tonight we have a savior in this story. And in the midst of all of this jumble of stuff that's happening here, in the midst of all of this, we have a savior who came to give his life. Yes, praise God, for sin, hallelujah, even her sin, even their sin. And so he, he accuses them. You know, who's, whoever's without sin, cast you the first one. One by one, they're convicted. One by one, they're judged in the presence of the king of glory. One by one, they see the failures in their own hearts and eyes. Do you know the amazing thing about this? One by one, they leave Jesus. And they're the sanctimonious ones. And he's left alone with her. And she's the downright sinner who has been caught in the act. And Jesus reveals sin. And one by one, they leave him. And she stays. And he says to her, woman, 
Where are your accusers? Does no man accuse you? She says, no man, Lord. And he says, neither do I. Go and sin no more. Isn't it an amazing thing? An amazing thing that those who thought that they were the, the righteous in this situation were the very ones who were convicted and went away convicted and went away still in their sin and the one who was taken in sin, praise God, stays with Jesus and receives those glorious words of forgiveness and pardon. And you see, that's the third thing I wanted to say tonight. Salvation. You see, in the hands of all our people, there's accusation. In the hands of the law, there's condemnation. The law has got to be paid. But thank God tonight, folks, in the hands of a Savior, there is salvation. Hallelujah. There's pardon. There's forgiveness. There's grace. Praise God, there's love. There's understanding. There's everything that this woman needed in her life. Everything was to be found in the Lord Jesus Christ. And in life, as everyone else in this situation had dealt with her in such a ridiculous way. Thank God there's a Savior in the midst of that who looks upon a heart. A heart, no doubt, that he sees as sorry. And a heart that's looking to him for whatever he's going to do. And in the midst of that, praise God, he speaks those glorious words to her. Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Can I ask you tonight where you stand with him? Maybe you're one of the people tonight who have been convicted and you need to be forgiven. Maybe you're one of those tonight who sit in this meeting saved and you've been convicted and you need to be forgiven. Will you do that tonight or will you leave like these did and just let that sit there somehow? Or maybe you're here tonight and you, you don't know him as Lord and Savior. And tonight we present him and the cross and that love and that sacrifice and that price that he has paid for sin. And we want to tell you, dear one, tonight, and I'm not suggesting for one moment that this is the kind of sin that you have committed. But I'm here to tell you tonight, it doesn't matter what sin or what kind of sin you have ever committed. Praise God, he is able to cleanse and to save and to forgive. And he can cleanse and save you and forgive you tonight. In this very place. If you, like this lady, will reach out to him. And ask him. Died upon a cross shed his precious blood so that you could be reconciled to God, so that you could be reconciled to him, so that you could experience the love, that you could experience the blessing, that you could experience the presence of God in your life every single day so that you could walk with him. Down life's journey with full assurance that whenever the time comes, you go to be with him for all of eternity. And I'm asking you tonight, have you come to Jesus? Because he understands and he cares and praise God he is able. And so folks, where do we stand tonight? Where do we stand? Do we need forgiveness of any kind? Thank God he's a pardoning savior. His love, as I've said, his understanding, praise God, his sacrifice, everything about him is so absolutely glorious. But he could not answer the question fully. He could only answer it by dying. And thank God tonight we look back to a cross where he laid down his life that a multitude of sins could be forgiven. Is there some sin that you need forgiveness for tonight? Then you bring it to Jesus. You bring it to him now. Let's pray. Praise God. I don't care who you are in this service tonight. By saying that, I mean I don't care if you profess to be saved or whether you don't. What I'm asking you is, if God has put something put a finger on something in your life tonight, I want to urge you to bring it to Jesus right now 
and ask his forgiveness. And I'm allowing you a moment to do that. And if I'm speaking to you, you know I am. And if you're here tonight and you don't know him as Lord and Savior, I'm giving you a moment as well. Because he's here tonight in the presence of his Holy Spirit. And he can touch your life. If you will reach out to him right now. And he will save you from sin. And folks, this is a strange kind of a message, I know. But please understand, God the Holy Spirit is speaking into situations here that he needs to speak into. And I make no apology for what he wants to do. I just urge you, let him have his way. Let him have his way. Reach out to him. Reach out to him. Reach out to him. And just allow him. I think of that one in old, the scriptures of old. He went up there and all he could say was, God be merciful to me, a sinner. He smote his chest. God be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus says that man went away justified. He went away right as if he had never sinned because he was completely truthful before a God who sees everything. And so that's what I'm asking you to do tonight because in love he reaches out and he simply says to you, come. Will you come this evening? Praise God. Praise God. And Father, we just reach out to you in the precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for a saviour. We thank you for a cross. We thank you for, Lord, a sacrifice that is completely adequate to meet every need. And we commit every life to you now. And we pray, loving God, in grace. Deal with every single one of us, Lord, in grace. Because we thank you that's the God that you are. So undertake, bless your word to every heart and move upon every life because we ask it in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God.